welcome. This is Sandra Hess, Executive Director of the Calaveras Wine Grape Alliance. And I have the pleasure today to sit down with Bob Bliss and Jim Riggs in interview number eight of the History of Calaveras Wine. Welcome. So we're gonna kick off today um, with some introductions and we're gonna learn about one of the very first wineries to be established here in Calaveras wine country, just the cellars uh, in the early 70s. And I came to uh, Calaveras County in about 1960. Okay. My grandfather was the foreman of a mine at Copper, and my father grew up there. And he told me I was crazy to move to it because the mines were closing and it was, it was mostly boarded up. Mm -hmm. And I rented a space for $25 a month. And uh, from Fred Fisk, he's a famous local scoundrel. Somewhere around 1970, uh, a fellow named Del Pedro and I uh, got involved in winemaking, and that Del showed up with. Uh, he had a farmer that owed, owed him a favor, and he wound up sh showing up with a ton of grapes. Anyway, and I can't remember exactly how Bob got involved, but somehow we got a open fermenter off of some guys in Sonora and invited everybody and started stopping and uh, figuring out how to make wine. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, the first year, we, because of Dell's generosity and everything, we wound up with more, at that time it was only legal to make 200 gallons. And we wound up like 600 gallons or something. So. Bob is an engineer and educated, and, uh, so he agreed to do the paperwork, and we submitted for a, a winery. And we must have submitted in '73 or '74. Okay. And 14 months later, you were licensed. Your first vintage was released in 1976. Yeah. And what kind of wine was that? Zinfandel. Zinfandel. And those grapes you mentioned came from Amador County. Yeah, I yeah. can't remember. Yeah, it's some Lock, Lock Springs Vineyard out there in Chenville Valley. Okay, so Bob, what brought you to Calaveras Wine Country? Well, it wasn't wine country when I moved here. Mm -hmm. yeah, I came here because I had a, I found a job. I grew up in East Bay. Okay. And uh, after the service, I went to San Jose State, completed college. And so we moved, we moved here, moved to Calaveras County in 71, and moved to Murphy's in 72. But I never got rich, but I worked. Mm -hmm. I stayed, stayed employed. Mm -hmm. I was primarily a surveyor. A surveyor, so you did mention you had an engineering background. Yeah, then I had a, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was your first experiences with wine? So prior to opening Shispa Cellars, um, what did you think about wine? Did you drink wine with your family growing up? Uh, what was your introduction to wine? Yeah. And what was your first wine? Was it a Zinfandel? Yeah, a Zinfandel. 14% alcohol. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. Higher alcohol. And what about you? What was your first experience with wine? My first experience with wine? Yes. <laughs> uh, my grandparents were Italian uh, little cheese glasses they had back oh, then. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so that was my first experience. And, and it was red wine. I had no idea what kind of grapes it was. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, you're not trying to The reason I got involved was because Jim was having a party stop and grapes. Mm -hmm. And I'd never been to a great stop before. So I went over to Jim's house. Jim was cutting my hair, that's how I know. And uh, just uh, added my feet to the to the other feet in the, mm. in the, in the barrel, you know, in the firm there. And, and, uh, so I think, yeah, it was kind of a an odd decision-making process to start the bonded winery. I, I don't know if it was a moment of insanity or just the next logical, well, let's try this out. It, it's like a lot of things. If you never try, you never know. Right. Um, I really don't see. Well, of course, we didn't. We didn't start the bonded winery with this whole thing in mind. Um, we did it because it was worth a try. I don't feel like. 
taking you know any kind of credit for what's happening now because I don't feel like we were that terribly successful. I mean, we didn't make great vast quantities of my wine. We so the time this is all happening, the early 70s, you know, in the previous interviews, we talk a lot about Barton Stevenau and what took place in the Calaveras wine country with Barton being very entrepreneurial and, and seeing the opportunity up here to plant grapes and start to work with people like Gay Callen and the Couts family and others. And so was that an inspiration for you both then when you thought about opening just the cellar? I involved with Barton Stevenau. Uh, he uh, was kind of a super businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you, when he got in the wine business overnight, he was doing a hundred times what we were doing. And uh, when we had the hot top business, the second week I was in business with him, he bought every pump and filter in the United States <laughs> and got the business just exploding. Like, and he kind of did the same thing at Kurtwood Meadows for skiing. And then he, like overnight, he was planting grapes on his uh, place. And, you know, one thing led to another. And so what happens is people like Bob and I uh, did what we thought we had to do or wanted to do or mm -hmm. somehow get beyond what we were right then. And, uh, and uh, Stephen O made a huge business out of it. Right. And that I think helped attract other businesses. Mm -hmm. Well, it was time to crush your gut, Frank, mm -hmm. because like a lot of things, grapes aren't are time sensitive, so when it's time to pick, they just call you up totally insane sometimes. And then we, we kind of rounded up a few friends to help us crush because our, our grapes came in field lug boxes, not big bends. We didn't own a, a, a forklift. And uh, so it was all hand hand done, you know. And uh, we used a bucket a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But I guess so we put it over here. Mm -hmm. we, had, we did have a pump. Actually faded in the barrel one time mm -hmm. because of uh, the carbon dioxide. Oh my goodness! And I'm glad Bob is big and strong. He pulled uh, me out. Wow! What a story! Yeah. So that must have been a pretty substantial that size was. barrel. For, for hours, I could my taste goodness. the carbon monoxide. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, so it is a dangerous business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, Barton, uh, you went full bore on mm -hmm. on that on his end, and uh, he had. He hired winemaker. Uh, I forget who the first one was, but, and I know that Dave also was kind of a the cellar guy, and uh, Steve Nellier was his winemaker for a while. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. He also, uh, I tell you a funny story about him. Uh, when his business started exploding, next thing I knew, he he was single then, so he had a girlfriend that was a, a accountant, CPA. And then when he got serious in the winemaking, he had a girlfriend, their family owned a winery in Napa. Oh. And okay. she had worked in it oh. and was helping him with the lab stuff. Mm. And that's when he got into hiring professional winemakers. And, uh, you know, like, like I said, he was an incredible businessman. So that's interesting, that story about his girlfriend from Napa. So that she brought a lot of interesting insights to him at that yeah. time in the early 70s. <laughs> I seem to me that anytime he needed some kind of an expert, he just got another girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. he knew what was good. Yeah, but he was pretty <laughs> dramatic uh, and I think uh, appealed to the ladies. I mean, yes. I heard that he was definitely a charmer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's generous too because his winemakers helped me out, mm -hmm. and I'd get myself in a bind. And uh, Steve Millier would help me out. Uh, Chuck Hudley would help me a couple of times. And uh, so you know, at that time, <clears throat> it was just standard procedure to help each other out. And, and of course, I was not, you know, grape educated or wine educated as I probably should have been. And, 
but he was incredibly helpful. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you think about this time and what's neat about the previous interviews is, you know, Kevin Locke and Stu Mast and Gabe Chatham and others, the Kelts family, talk a lot about still today how this winemaking community is about helping one another. Well, your first release was in 1976. It was the first time we sold one. Yes. And yeah. so it was in Mendel initially. And then over time, did you make other varietals? Yes. Yeah. Did you stick with Zen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tried a few different things. Mm -hmm. In the hair salon, I worked with a lady, uh, uh, Beverly Benedetto. And uh, Benedetto is the name of uh, two Italian guys that grew up in Amateur County. <laughs> One of them is a famous singer, Tony Bennett. Oh. His real name is Benedetto. Oh my goodness. And Beverly's father uh, grew up there and inherited the family house. Mm. And so I went over there. I'm, I'm a real estate broker too, almost everything. So I went over there to look at the house and I saw that there were vines there. And I said, where did those come from? And he said, well, my grandfather brought them from Italy. So I cut about five or 600 cuttings. An old guy had shown me how to do that and planted them down uh, where a, a lower kennel used to be. Mm -hmm. If you look at those great vines down there, I, they're all cuttings from those old Italian vines. And what kind of wine? What kind of I vines? suspect Griglanino, but I'm, uh, <laughs> by looking at the leaves and looking at the bunches, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a guess. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty hard to tell. Well, and you think about the gold rush era here, and you think about even pre-gold rush, there's always this prospecting, pioneering spirit in the Sierra foothills, right? And so families coming over, bringing with them their cuttings, right. you know, for their home production. Um, you think about the Trincaro family, um, the Krugs back in the day, the same stories happening throughout Napa were happening here. Yeah. And one interesting fact, you know, we think about 1851 is where we have a documentation of the first grapes being planted near the Calaveras uh, uh, River. But an interesting fact that Calaveras County by 1870 had become the fourth largest uh, wine producing county in the state of California, 116 winemakers. Uh, and the 10 years the county's wine production grew from 277 gallons to 860 in, in 1860, 100,000 gallons by 1870. So when you were making wine then, let's call it mid 60s, when was your last vintage? In 81. In 81. What was it like here at that time with enjoyment of wine? Were people really new to uh, tasting uh, uh, wine? Well, I, can, and, tell you, I yeah. can tell you one interesting story. I was in my hair salon and mm -hmm. I looked out and I saw a guy walking up and down Main Street and we didn't have any signs or we didn't advertise our uh, tasting room. We didn't have a tasting room, which is at a wine rate, mm -hmm. but very small. And he was walking up and down and he had Sunset Magazine under his arm. So I went out and asked him what he was looking for. And sure enough, he was looking for our wine rate. Oh. And Sunset Magazine had put a uh, line and a half, very small, mentioning that there was a boutique winery in mm -hmm. Colorado County mm -hmm. and it named our winery. And so you don't know the effect of that magazine ad, I think, on what yeah. went on. Right, Discovery Calaveras Wine Country. I mean, yeah. so this is like we're talking mid-70s, yeah. Sunset Magazine includes a mention. Yeah. Every day or so, I'd see somebody walking up and down with that magazine. Back over to Bob, what were people thinking about wine at the time? They first started tasting your wine. Well, what was think, it like? I think the little articles that popped up uh, probably got it. You know, I, I did take part of that barn down there, and I did turn it into a, a wine, a, you know, a tasting room. Well, we only had one variety. If you don't like Zinfandel, well, you're out of luck, you know? Mm -hmm. But I was going to wine tastings. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't go and taste wine. I went to wine tasting for wine. And my first wine tasting I went to was something in San Francisco at the Hall of Flowers. Okay. I did it. I did my first, so I just took some stuff and had no idea what I was stepping into. But I think that was probably the only fun time that I really enjoyed with some of these wine tastings. And I went to a small wine tasting 
just specifically for small wineries down in Orange County. I've gone out three times and met some folks down there. But the whole the whole thing here was pretty small. I mean, Steve and it was it was us. Uh, but you know, as, as things evolved, they evolved. And uh, uh, Jan and Dave want to make a little wine themselves, so I had room in the barn. So yeah, I'd find it, you know. And then Steve and Liz wanted to make some wine. I said, yeah, I had room. So I let them use the bar. Oh. I mean, it was no big deal. Just bring your barrels and, you know, whatever I got. I had a milk tank. That was something hard and help me find. It was out of some way out, it's somewhere around St. Helena. I got this uh, milk tank. I got a thousand gallon milk tank, which was pretty good to use because it was only about that high. And, you know, long mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was insulated, stainless steel, so it was ideal for fermenting. And, um, and how creative also, you know, Stephen, I'm thinking outside of the box at the time. Yeah, well, so, yeah, he's right. like, hey, you know, there's a, there's a milk tank. Oh. I had no idea what a milk yeah. tank was. Right. What do I know about this stuff? Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah, okay, fine, let's go look at this mm -hmm. thing. And we, we bought it. And Jim and I went to a couple of auctions and bought stuff and uh, I know we bought some redwood sherry tanks one time that were yeah, sherry on the stuff. Well yeah it it, 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 take, it smelled like sherry, you know. Mm -hmm. some some winery down in Lodi and uh, we bought those big tanks. So we bought one or two of them, I don't remember they were fourteen feet high and fourteen feet across. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of shaped a little bit on the odd because they were, they made brandy in them. So and we, uh, redwood was about that thick. Oh yeah, they were really. To get them out of the building, we had dismantled the end of the building. Oh okay. And then we we got a a, a logger that we knew here had a flatbed and. Uh, 10,445 bonded wineries in the U.S. today. Oh, yeah. 4,700 wineries alone. Oh, in just go to Oregon or anywhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 40 tasting rooms now in Calaveras Wine Country. Um, so, you know, I think 45% of adults reported uh, drink wine today. And you think about the early 70s, the time, the mid 70s, the time that Chispa Cellars was, uh, you know, presenting Zinfandel and Italian varietals to the community here. And then it was spirits and beer. So maybe like 10% of people were even drinking or tasting wine at that time. So, yeah. I mean, you're coming into a situation of experimentation, right? And, and finding out, you know, with this community, what they were going to be interested in. And so when you and your five years at Chispa Cellars, I love that you bring up that you had this barn that became kind of collective for the Milliers, uh, for Jan and Dave Olson. And so I yeah. can just envision you all in this collective state um, working out of the barn, sharing thoughts and ideas about what you were making, maybe what you were thinking about doing next, right? But at that time, did, like, for example, did you sell your wine to the hotel, to Murphy's Hotel? No. Were people drinking no. wine there? No. I don't know why we didn't sell it to the hotel. Mm -hmm. I don't know who we always do. You were more in charge of selling it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst part of the whole thing because you get too close to your product and you try and sell it when people say no. Mm -hmm. I had these wine tastings and I was down in Southern California, so I did have wine at the Hotel Del Coronado. Oh. And I did have wine in a couple of wine shops down in LA. Oh, okay. And uh, so then I periodically, you know, threw a couple of cases of wine in the car race off down to LA and uh, I never did leave that Orange County wine tasting thing slipped over it. But uh, I did have a friend with me. Mm -hmm. I had friends in Pasadena. And we have a day. friend uh, we have a friend that works in Hollywood and uh, he joined a wine tasting club down there. Mm -hmm. And most of the people were uh, in the club are distributors and things like that. very serious wine. Okay. And I don't know if we got any context to sell our wine. Uh, no, I, yeah. met, I, I met a few people down down there. One person wanted to represent the wine. Mm -hmm. But, you know. I had another experience. Worked out real well. With the first Newman bill we made, a friend of mine was an airline pilot all over the world, so he was kind of sophisticated. So I said to him, well, uh, you want to taste our wine? And 
it was Synthodel at 14% alcohol. And he took a drink of it and he says, it doesn't taste like wine, it tastes like grape juice. Wow, that's a good point. He didn't realize it, but I did. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty pretty. Yeah, very fruit forward, which a lot of times, especially with Zinfandel, that's what you're wanting is just let lead Flavor with the pick. fruit. Right. right. Well, the idea, I make wine now mm -hmm. because I have a hundred wines around my house. Mm -hmm. But the ideal thing in making wine is you uh, the Grapes, as they grow, mm -hmm. are all acid in the beginning, and then they turn to sugar. And uh, if you, we took classes at uh, UC Davis, oh, okay. and a professor put these formulas up, and they're all about the same, but the C and H's are moved around. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, when you ferment, you get rid of the sugar. Mm -hmm. Okay, the sugar's gone, and half of the product uh, is carbon monoxide and the other half is alcohol. And so you have this liquid with alcohol in it to replace the sugar. Mm -hmm. And part of your flavor of the fruit is the sugar and the acids that are still in there, like melolactic acids. And, and so to make a wonderful wine, how do you get rid of the sugar and still get the taste. Mm -hmm. So you can identify Zinfandel or Grenache or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Hmm. So you, you talk about, you know, kind of the process and wine enjoyment and wine education. And I think about you were located on the end of Main Street where now Valdivino Winery is. And so I'm envisioning you all in your winery no, we there. We started out right next to the Murphy's Hotel. Oh, it was right next to the Murphy's where Hotel. Where Zuko was. Okay, that's right. So you, the basement of Zuko. Yeah. A and so that was your basement, first, yeah. and we're, that's where you were first presenting your wines, basically. Yeah. And then you ended up moving to the barn Good, over, yeah, to which the is barn, now Valdivino. Yeah. The barn was a huge store. Oh. They moved out. We thought it'd be a good spot. A lot more room. We didn't have to bang our I head see. all the time on his cellar. Uh, so yeah. we moved over there, but we had to clean it out. Okay. Uh, fixed up a little bit. So then, um, and you were talking about the grape stomping. And so obviously we just celebrated our 27th annual grape stomp. But you were doing grape stomping, as you mentioned. Well, and more we, primitive. Before we had the grape stomp event. Yes. We, we decided to, uh, you know, and this Del Pedro was managing a, a Kramer ranch here. Okay. And uh, so he comes up, shows up with a ton of grapes. So we really quick bought this, well, I don't know, 12 by 12 foot bath, mm -hmm. a redwood bath, okay. and put a ladder there. And, You've got to crush the grapes somehow. Right. Because we certainly didn't have a crush or anything like they have nowadays. So we started inviting people. And in those days, uh, there was no television in Murphy's because we were down in the hole. There was not, not a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And so it became uh, a real fun. Like a community fun. gathering. Yeah. So and then we had people from teenagers to. Mm -hmm. 85 year old mm -hmm. uh, people that climbed in there. I mean, it was a, a what real an adventure. experience for them because they yeah. had never done this before. You right. think about the old I Love Lucy, right. you know, shows of seeing her doing the great shopping. So they probably had something in their minds about what this was going to be well, like I don't know at some how point. It all came about. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we were also involved with some Hollywood people. Mm -hmm. that, uh, they had made a movie here in different places. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we, did, say, we did get a little more serious over at the barn. We got it was general. Oh, you did? Yes. So then the, that community gathering kind of went yeah, away. Yeah, they started getting more serious. Yes. Yeah, well, and then time. we got a, a truck and trailer load one, one of the first things when we got in the barn. Mm -hmm. Well, what is that, 20,000 pounds or something? And, you know, hand stomping it with your feet, or it's not going to happen. Yeah, we just no. recruited some younger folks and unloaded truck and just dumped them in a, in a crusher and just pumped it into a tank. We had these 50 pound lugs. Uh, John Couts was working for Tri Valley Growers at that time. Uh -huh. Seven uh, operations in California. And uh, they were getting into bigger scale boxes. And so he had these 50 pound lug boxes packed up. Uh, 
he had 50,000 of them. Uh, that's how big Tri Valley Growers was in those days. And uh, he offered to sell us. So I went down there with the truck trailer. I don't remember if you were with me. Or, uh, anyway. So Chisp was sellers then, you know, for five years, um, mid 70s, to early 80s. Obviously, you mentioned uh, LA scene, San Francisco going out and presenting at these wine yeah, shows. Yeah, it was, it was mm -hmm. I think, the discouraging part is I did. I did a tasting for Channel Six in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. It was also combined with a horse show. I don't know anything about horses, but I was sitting next. I was I was set up. I was set up next to Delicato, mm -hmm. and the the wine fashion at that time was white Zinfandel. Well, I don't. We didn't make white Zinfandel, mm -hmm. right? And I'm at this. Tasting on porn with Zinfandel out of view, which is red wine, right? And I was getting people, more than one, that were shocked that this was red. It didn't taste like strawberry soda, right? Like Delicados <laughs> over here. But how did I get that red color? And I, I was just stunned, you know, that, okay, we got these people tasting wine, but they don't have a clue. And uh, so, you know, you get kind of uh, kind of down in the mouth about that whole concept because you, but what we're really doing was just kind of educating the palate a little bit. If we had to in those days. Yes. But, you know, they, they just, the, the whole idea was how did, how did you make this bread? I did a blind tasting. Mm -hmm. I did a blind tasting where I put blindfolds on people. Mm -hmm. And a third of the people couldn't tell white wine from red wine. Oh my goodness. When they're blindfolded. I love that you did the blind tasting back then also because people were so new to wine discovery, to the enjoyment of wine, to the sensory experience. Yeah. And so you gave them that perspective. And I'm sure for you at the wine shows, it must have been it must have been a mixed bag. You probably had some people who were sophisticated, maybe drinking imports from France and well, maybe Italy, and then others who just didn't know anything. That's yeah, funny. kind of like like that. There were, I found that uh, when I went to a wine tasting as a taster, mm -hmm. um, or actually when I was pouring, but when I wasn't pouring, I was tasting, which is probably not the best way to do it. I tasted only really one variety at a time. So I would go to, go to a wine tasting, and when my friend that was with me or my wife was pouring, I went around and tasted just the same caps. I mm -hmm. like red wine. Mm -hmm. And I tasted all the caps. And then the, the next time I went to a wine tasting, when I wasn't pouring, I would go and taste gins. But I would just taste one because when you taste everything that people are pouring, you're going to get so messed up, you have, have a clue what you wind up with. And that one in, in Sacramento was was just a, was discouraging. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but beyond that, you just, you just had to work, you had to work through it in your mind that although people may not like red wine, there's no reflection on your product necessarily, although you're way too close to the product. And then when you try to sell a product, people say, oh, no, I don't think I like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're just, you're yeah, devastated. Yeah, sure. yeah. I'm you're sure. devastated, you know, you, you go home, you know, you're down a mountain, you, you know, you kick a couple of rocks around the yard, but uh you have to get over that and there's always going to be that buyer who does enjoy yeah. your art and what you're presenting yeah. and something that's yeah, there's, there's going to be some mm -hmm. handcrafted and so i mean i i used to go to some tastings and i'd have a case in the trunk of the car i actually sold it out of the trunk of the car <laughs> Yeah, Love it. The sure. I um, got to know Barton Stevenow, had this beautiful wine collective with the Milliers, the Olsons, and others. When you decided to part ways, what was that like? Were you thinking about selling Chispa Cellars? Um, how did that conversation it go? It to me that uh, every year we kind of quadrupled, mm -hmm. and it was seemed to me it was a little out of control. Mm -hmm. Mom and I were involved, involved in several real estate investments. Okay. And so we did a trade mm -hmm. and it got me out of uh, hard work and operation. <laughs> Five years of major physical labor, yeah. it sounds like to me. I, I continued with it. But then it was growing. Okay. So 
father was better at getting recruiting help and getting it done. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I continued with it for a while, and uh, after Jan and Dave, they wanted there for a while, and uh, they they wanted to whatever they were doing, they wanted to start their own winery. So I I sold it every well. There wasn't much to sell really, but I sold whatever I had to them. I see. And they that that's how they that's how black sheep are. I see. Okay. Um Steve and Liz had made a couple of vintages there. And uh, but I don't I don't after I left, I didn't follow the city mm -hmm. too closely, so whatever happened, happened, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But Jan and Dave the black sheep and made it up. Extremely more successful than chips was so you should have thought about being. Mm -hmm. And uh, in what ways would you would you say it is successful being that they produce more, they had more varietals, they had local fruit? What was the success, do you think? I think they ran it more like a business okay. than I did. Mm -hmm. Well, he was also working in engineering. Mm -hmm. Well, was, yeah, I had a day job and also I had a family, but I mean, I they had jobs and family too. Okay. But, um, yeah, they, they just, um, I think they were just probably better educated and more dedicated probably than I was. And uh, I think just, to, and they, they were, they, they were successful. Well, they got seriously into it. This yeah, I think they were. Well, they really committed to it. It is the why we named it just a song. Yes, please. I would love to learn the name. Okay, it's an old, old word. It goes back to Roman times. Okay. In Italy. And uh, uh, the Spaniards use a var variation on it a little bit. And uh, Mexicans know that word, a little bit of a variation on it. But this old word meant bright object. Mm -hmm. like the first star of the evening. Oh. But the Italian miners, uh, if they got a saw gold nugget in their pan, they called it a chispa. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. I've never heard this. And uh, Native Sons Hall over here, is, uh, that lodge is called Chispa Cellars. Oh. And so that's where I got the idea to use that name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so Chispa interesting. Parlor, yeah. yeah. Chispa just the parlor. And so that's so part of this era, the gold rush era right. up here. So you really were thoughtful about naming just the sellers after something right. that was important. And I was kind of disappointed mm -hmm. when they changed it to Black Sheep, but they thought that market had better and they know they knew what they were doing better than I did. Well at the time they were living on sheep ranch. Yeah. Oh, I see. So thus the black sheep. So as we wrap up in our time together today, you've shared with me some interesting insights and perspectives. And you're just thinking about even when the Olsons took over the business from the evolution of the consumer, uh, of the wine enthusiast. I mean, you had five years, you know, of progression. And I think that maybe, you know, more towards the early 80s, mid 80s, consumers were probably more familiar with wine and with what it well, meant. Well, about that time, uh, some uh, Napa people entered competitions in France and won gold medals. Mm -hmm. And so people got aware of California. Uh, the other thing is that wine is made in New York, right? but it's from the New World grapes as opposed to Vinifera, the uh, European grapes. And it has a skunky aftertaste and some things about it like Moke and David, and those mm -hmm. kind of wines are just couldn't get popular, like beer and cocktails and that sort of thing. Where the huge varieties of Vitafera, I think, allow people, I mean, if you're tasting 15 different wines, there's bound to be one you like, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, speaking of that, you know, we talked earlier about how. 40 tasting rooms in Calaveras wine country, 22 tasting rooms right here on Main Street. You can probably taste 100, 150 bridles uh, throughout this just Main Street area alone. What are some of your favorite wines or bridles that you're enjoying here today? Here we are, you know, fall of 2020. So what is that like yeah, for you? Well, I have 100 wines and I have, they're half the Petit Sarah and half uh, Cabernet Franc. Okay. And then uh, Hatcher on some property I own 
planted about 15 or 20 Zinfandels. Oh, okay. So I put a teeny bit of Zinfandel in with, you know, maybe 5% or something. But you'd be surprised how it punches up the color. Zinfandel has a marvelous uh, ruby-like color. And I, when I went, I went to France to go to Paris school and stuff and it got into food and wine over there mm -hmm. and I noticed that they have presentations of food and wine right. that are uh, entice your brain and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and I think that's part of it if you look at a, a beautiful Zinfandel it, it, it's going to taste better mm -hmm. right just that sensory experience the yeah. visual the pairing the smells which foods pair you know, most beautifully with a spicy style Zinfandel or a peppery style Zinfandel, et cetera. Yeah. So it is interesting, the evolution of, of uh, wine and food here in uh, 2020. And so it sounds like you are still then growing grapes, yeah. which I think is really interesting that initially, originally you had purchased from Amador County and now you're growing grapes here in Calaveras. Yeah. And so are you selling those to some of the winemakers no, then uh, up here? No, I give away the wine. I don't sell it. Uh, uh, the county coroner bought a house off of me mm -hmm. and he planted the grapes oh. and the house happened to be at my uh, sister-in-law was dying from breast cancer mm -hmm. and that house happened to be ideal and he got and made too many small loans from banks and stuff so mm -hmm. I wound up selling him that house then I bought it back from the bank and uh, when I got it back, I got the uh, hundred fines. Oh, interesting. So that was a nice little gift. So I got back presented. into my yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily my choice. Right, but it just kept following you. So yeah, here and, you are today. And, and Zuka's retired and mm -hmm. went out. So he yes. sold me a Skimmer Crusher. Oh, okay. Yeah. So oh, I, so now fun. I'm, you know, like, in the beginning, I'm growing again. So it's more of a hobby for you at this point. Well, yeah, but now I'm 85 years old, so it, I don't know. My daughter and son-in-law and different people didn't help me, I'd be in trouble. Well, you know, they say centurions all over the world um, when they are interviewed, you know, people who live 100 plus in these concentrated areas across the world, especially in Italy, they talk about the secret to long life and happiness, having a glass of red wine yeah. every day. And so it's nice to hear that you're involved in the wine industry in some aspect right. here today. What about you, Bob? What are some wines that you're enjoying today? I kind of stick to the local wines. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, and of course, I, I support Black Sheep and I support the money, so I, I do buy their wines and, yeah. and enjoy those. Do you, are there still Zinfandel that you like the most? The reds, yeah. Mm -hmm. The reds are calves. Mm -hmm. um, Miller makes it. Simply red wine, which is yes. really pretty, pretty good. I do like that simply red. It's a nice More blend. Price, right? mm -hmm. yeah. yes. But uh, Chuck Covey, several years ago, made a Tempranillo mm -hmm. that uh, when I was chatting with him, he thought he was just bubbling over. Because he had entered it in a wine tasting in Spain and he took the gold. Oh, goodness. And I okay. raced off to the store and I bought the rest of the Tempranillo that was in the store. I said, don't raise the price. <laughs> and I raced off to the store. I bought all the Tempranillo that was there. And uh, it just, and that, that kind of put some Calaveras wines on the, yes. you know, moved up to the, the front of the pack, you know? Yes. Another visionary, Chuck Hubby in Tempranillo. Yeah. And knowing that this was the, the proper climate, the proper soil profile yeah. to make some really interesting he made, Tempranillo. He made, he made some good wines, and I know that. I appreciated his help when I was struggling, you know, with making wine and get getting things screwed up. You offer up some advice and help. It's neat for me to hear these stories of the beginning years, the formative years of the Calaveras wine country as we know it today, and the community that came alongside you all. And I really appreciate you taking time to meet with me and share a little bit of your history. Um, as we wrap up, I always ask this question uh, in every one of my uh, interviews, and that is, you know, the progressions um, from the mid-70s to here we are today, 40 tasting rooms now in 2020. 
What would be your vision or your words of wisdom, maybe your wishes for the future of Calaveras wine country? Oh, same old, same old. Same old, same old. Keep it the same, not grow too much, maybe. I, I have a, I'm not that good of a visionary. <laughs> I imagine trying to uh, get little shops going and making uh, Murphy's. And that's now more complicated than I had ever imagined. Like we own the bookstore, oh, okay. and I own a couple. I, yeah, I own a couple other businesses like the consignment shop. Oh, and okay. Uh, and the thing I found out now is that there's a need that we don't have all tasting room. So I'm actually renting to some people cheaper mm -hmm. that have other businesses like the bookstore. We give her. Sure. Uh, hell of a morning. Sure. And uh, I think as a healthy community, we need something other than just getting drunk at the tasting room. Sure. Groups. So, I mean, well, you can have so many uh, winery tasting rooms on Main Street, right? Yeah. 22 is quite a bit for this small okay. amount of space that we have. So, just the balance then of businesses and restaurants, bookshops, uh, hair salons, well, whatever yeah, it is. Other, yeah, well, these tasting rooms, you're only, only, only going to draw up a one portion of society. So if we kind of uh, introduce other businesses, um, but beyond to answer your question, I never really give it any thought. I mean, yeah. it's what it is. Um, because people could go in the cycle shop and buy a t-shirt or something besides just buying wine. Sure. Yeah. 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 Obviously, I never foresaw this happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we were doing the wine, we did it because we wanted to, and we we're going to do it because we thought it'd be interesting, and, and it, we would always, if we didn't try it out, we would always be asking ourselves, well, what if? Why didn't we? Yeah, yeah why didn't we try that? That would have been interesting. But this whole thing going on now, I, I, I we never, that never entered our mind, never mm -hmm. gave it a thought. Things don't turn out like you think. <laughs> when Hatcher first rented his tasting room from me, he was looking at buildings behind the Murphy's Hotel. And I showed him the basement and he says, ah, this is a crummy place, it's, you know, whatever. And I said, well, you know, people store wine in basements, it's kind of, and so finally, because I was rent cheaper, I guess he moved into that basement. Well, it become a smashing success, probably one of the most successful. Uh, you know, he told me one time if he didn't, Sell twenty thousand a month. He was well, he not doing good. Yeah, but he's making so, a good product. Yeah, too. and uh, so it shocked him, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, he uh, makes wine, but he hires winemakers. He is a businessman that was uh, selling ice cream before he got in that business. So he's more of a marketing person, and quite keen about that, although he's become keen about, uh, and he helps out anybody. He bought a expensive testing machine if anybody wants to know how much alcohol or acid or sulfites or whatever in your wine. And uh, so, yeah, that's part of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, do you have any bottles of Chispa in your cellars, any vintage? Uh, no, i got a friend that's got one. Uh huh. He has a wine cellar in LA. Well, I would love to find out where I could maybe purchase some Chispa cellars, and it'd be really fun to revisit some of those wines that you produced. Yeah, you probably put them. Well, it's probably not a salad drinkable mm -hmm. anymore. <laughs> and like I said, I've got some of the labels. I'll yeah. bring you one. Oh, I would love that. That'd yeah. be a lot of fun just to add to our history of uh, the wine scene here. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for your time. I appreciate you chatting with me. Um, I think that we continue to learn through each of these interviews about what it was like to be a part of the formative years here in California in country. <laughs> the yeah. primitive, pretty formative, basic. pretty basic years. But congratulations in the time that you had with uh, the Calaveras wine scene. And I'd love to hear what you end up doing with your grapes as you progress there. Enjoy the rest of your day ahead. Thank you. Yeah.